Welcome friends and family. This is Pastor of Overcoming Church and we're going to go into course three, prophetic ministry. There are three layers for this particular course. Number one, are there different kinds of prophets? Number two, how to recognize you are called to the prophetic. And then number three, how to develop your prophetic expression and language. But before I get to that, I just want to give a few um, announcements and reminders. Number one, I know that I'm uploading the PDF file, but it's very essential that you listen to the recordings because when you're speaking about the prophetic, such as what we are, um, there are impartations and we haven't really talked that much about it in detail, but one of the ways that we see, one of the ways that we receive an impartation of a particular grace anointing um, or um, a gifting is through teaching or through the ministry of laying on of hands. So don't just read it, but make sure you are listening to it because there's an impartation of revelation knowledge that's in the teaching. Number two, I want to just remind you, um, donate as God leads. Why? Because there's a blessing with that. I know there's no requirement to take this course as far as finances because, I mean, I just wanted this to be open to so many people that cannot afford to pay five hundred dollars for this and for, for that however the lord does honor when we um sow back into the ministry when we sow into a teaching or a word or a revelation or when you are sowing uh, as i'm sowing into your spiritual gifting and development it's essential that you talk to God about how can I sow back into that. The Bible even speaks about a prophet's reward. And we know that people have come and abused those things, but they are legitimate in Scripture. There's still power. There's still anointing. And there's still legitimacy in tithing and sowing and donating, especially when you know you're sowing into a ministry that is prophetic. OK, so let's get into this course. Um, number one, are there different kinds of prophets? And the answer is yes there are six to seven kinds of prophets i'm just going to focus on one and each of them flow from the same particular anointing okay the the the, the prophetic anointing okay sons and daughters shall prophesy that is a prophetic anointing the gift of prophecy prophetic anointing so there are different kinds of prophets and they all flow from the same kind of an anointing however the makeup is unique and there's a diversity of different kinds of prophets and the reason why i wanted to add this into the course it's because i want you to stop comparing yourself with other people i want you to stop looking at the prophet on youtube facebook or on Daystar, Word Network, and TBN and comparing yourself. So we're going to look at six kinds of prophets and you are going to see yourself either in one, two, or you may see a emerging or rather um, a convergence of yourself in the different kinds of prophets. Okay, but there's a quote here. Let's read that. It says a prophet is a teacher of known truth. A seer is a perceiver of hidden truth. The reason why I added that into that quote, because to me, that's just a phenomenal explanation of one of the differences between a prophet and a teacher, a prophet and a seer rather. Both of them can convey the same message, but how the prophet receives the message is different from how a seer perceives a message. A prophet will hear a message Nabi or Nabi, which is, you know, we talked about that before and we're going to talk about it again. But a seer will often do what? Look at the word seer, C-E-E, -E. see. Oftentimes when you have a prophet and a seer, a seer will catch a vision of what God is saying. A prophet will hear or sense what God is saying. So let's go into the different kinds of prophets. And again, as you read this, come into revelation of what kind of prophet you are and, and own it and, and appreciate it, honor it, allow the Lord to develop and nurture it and stop comparing yourself with others. So you have Nabi or Nabi, and it means to bubble up. This kind of prophet is a prophet that moves with an unction of the Holy Spirit. It's like fire shut up in your bones. That's the, I, mean, I think that's the scripture that I use right there because Jeremiah was this kind of prophet where the word of the Lord came in him and then out of him like an explosion. It was a flow. That's why it used 
uses. That's why this particular definition has the illustration of a flow or water because this kind of prophet flows with a sensation of being prompted by the Holy Spirit to speak a word that comes out like fire. So Jeremiah 20 verse 9, but if I say I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, his word is in me like fire fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it. Indeed, I cannot. Oftentimes, these are the kind of prophets such as my, myself that, you know, you, they would tend to say, I got to speak. I got to preach. I got to declare the word of the Lord. Because remember, preaching is a part of the prophetic manifestation and the anointing as well. Um, so this is one kind of a prophet. Um, it's very similar to a preaching kind of prophet. And then you have Roe, or, Ro, or Roe, which is a seer kind of prophet. And the definition says discernment, seeing on people, through people, through dreams. Um, this is a seer. God works with this kind of prophet oftentimes in the realm of imagination and in the realm of dream and vision. And I'm going to read Daniel chapter 7 verse 2, but with this kind of prophet, they have to watch out, all of them. But really, with the seer, you, they have to watch out because oftentimes, um, because God uses the realm of your imagination as a seer, um, that means that, how can I say this? When you are a seer and your imagination has been polluted due to filth or pornography or things of that nature, that can filter into your prophetic perception. Let's read this. Daniel 7 verse 2. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked up and there before me was the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the other, came out of the sea. Um, you know, not getting into the contextuality of that text, but it's pertaining to the end time and the, um, the nations that will rise up at the end time to form a, um, an alliance with the Antichrist. But the reason why I selected this passage is because Daniel was a seer. He was a seer prophet and God oftentimes spoke to Daniel through dreams and through visions. In contrast with Jeremiah, he came to him in the word of the Lord. But we're going to look at Ezekiel, who oftentimes had a vision. But then we see that the Bible says now the word of the Lord came to the came to Ezekiel, son of man. So there are times where you can where the Lord will interact with you as a prophet through different tunnels because he really wants to activate all of the prophetic rivers of communication. OK, then you have Shamar watch. Watchmen. This is the prophet that sees God's timing when things happen. You talk about the anointing of the sons of Issachar. Okay, the sons of Issachar were a particular tribe that had that God, God gave them the anointing and he gave them the gift to be able to accurately discern the time and the season and what Israel ought to do. So a watchman or shamar is a kind of prophet that God anoints to sound the alarm, to see in the spirit, and to be able to forecast things that are going to happen to a country, a nation, a community, a region, a church. And oftentimes these prophets are very big on, hey, I see danger coming. Hey, uh, the, the economy is getting ready to collapse. Uh, hey, uh, there's a shifting. Not only is it for danger, because if you look at the context of the watchman um, in the Old Testament, when oftentimes the watchmen did what? They stood, they had a position on the gate where they were able to see oncoming danger and sound the alarm. But not only that, a watchman also has the anointing to discern when there is a change in the season. God is doing something different. So put down the prophetic tools of last season and pick up the new prophetic tools. They have the ability to say, hey, God is doing a new thing that worked for the last generation, that worked in the last move of God, that worked too years ago, but there's no anointing. There's no grace on that. There's something else. Let's go into prayer and fasting and receive the now revelation of what God is doing. That is the watchman anointing friends and family. And I will tell you this, the watchman anointing is um, one of the most rejected kinds of prophets. And the reason why it's because one, we don't teach that a watchman is a prophet. Number two, because again, they predict things that are getting ready to happen. So Ezekiel chapter three, verse 17, 
18 and 19, son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear, okay, that goes back to Nabi or Nabi, hear the word of the Lord. Um, at thy mouth and give them the warning for me. Okay. Um, so again, Ezekiel, Ezekiel is one of my favorites because I mean, he moved in so many different prophetic rivers. As you can see, I'm even using him for the next kind of prophet. Number four, which is a visionary, very similar to a seer, but it's a little different. Um, Ezekiel chapter one, verse one, and there is a particular passage in the book of Acts where Peter was caught up in a trance. And if you remember, God tells him in that vision, do not call unclean what I have called clean. Well, he was caught in a trance, but Ezekiel chapter one, verse one, now it came to pass in the third Thirteenth year in the fourth month on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chabar, that the heavens were open, okay, and I saw visions of God on the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jeho oh Lord um, Jehoiakim's captivity. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of, Chalde of Chaldeans by the river of Chabar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. So it says vision, but if you look at the Hebrew, that actually was a trance. It was an open vision. Now, there are different kinds of visions. So number one, there is a vision that is of the mental imagination. OK, this is one of the first dimensions. It's not in your notes, but this is the first dimension of how God communicates us, communicates to us in a vision. It is using your imagination. It's not an open vision. It's not a dream. It is, it's just God showing you something using your human imagination. Sometimes we miss it because it's so normal. Um, and it's so normal to us. I mean, we use our imagination all the time, but we don't realize that the Holy Spirit will use your imagination and show you a picture of something to communicate to you. But then that's the first dimension of a vision. Then there's another dimension of a vision, friends and family, where it's an open vision. You literally see a picture or something sort of like a movie or whatever God is showing you. You see it outwardly, but it as it is supernatural. This is what Ezekiel is experiencing. This is what the apostle Peter was experiencing when the Lord gave him that vision concerning not calling the Gentile church or the Gentile believers unclean. He was caught up in a trance or an open vision. And so this particular prophet, very similar to a seer, they move in that dimension of imagination and visual, visual visualization and open vision and trances, but an open vision, very similar again to a trance. The only difference I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize with an open vision and a trance is a trance causes you to be taken up into a realm where you become, it's like you are in the dream. It's like you are in the vision rather than an open vision. It's like you can just see into something. But a trance takes you into the very thing that you're seeing. I hope that makes sense. Number five, you have the prophets that foretell of the future. Very similar to the watchmen. So I don't know if you've recognized this now, but some of the anointings and the characteristics of each of these prophets, sometimes they intermingle, but yet they are different and they are unique. So number five is the prophet that foretells the future, that predicts the future. Okay, Joel chapter two, and afterward I will pour out my spirit upon all people. We know this. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old man will dream dreams. Your young Young men will see visions, even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show them wonders in the heavens, on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Um, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the, whom the Lord calls. So Joel is predicting the future. Now, I know we quote this passage um, in <clears throat> the earlier parts. I will pour out my spirit. I still believe that we are in the dispensation of God pouring out his spirit. However, if you continue to read about the things that will happen in the in the skies and the heavens and in the earth. Well, contextual wise, we know he's speaking about the last days, the coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church, the tribulation, that particular area that is known as the day of the Lord. Well, he is predicting something that is in the future, similar to 
Isaiah who prophesied the past, the present, and the future. So number five is the prophet that foretells of the future. They predict the will of God that will happen in the future concerning man and nations. And then you have Natav, which is the preaching prophet, tearing open heaven, bringing revelation, freedom through energetic, vocalized preaching or prophecy, because remember, preaching is a form of prophecy. Now, let me help some of you out. Um, Bishop Iona Locke is an example of this kind of prophet. Um, Bishop T.D. Jakes is an example of this kind of prophet. Now, again, many of us would never consider T.D. Jakes a prophet because we, again, have limited our understanding concerning the different prophets mantles and anointings and expressions, but there is a prophet that is called to preach the word of God. It's not necessarily foretelling the future. It's not necessarily revealing a dream or vision, but it's a fiery anointing. It's an energetic anointing. It's a stirring up anointing that is so fiery. It opens up heavens. It shins, it sends prophetic shakings in someone's spirit that moves them to praise, moves them to worship, moves them to come to the altar in repentance. It's a burning preaching. It's a particular kind of anointing that we saw during the early days of the Pentecostal denomination, okay, that came out of Azusa Street Revival. This is a very rare anointing that you don't see nowadays in, in, in my particular generation, but it is, it is, a, it is a prophetic anointing. It, it is to preach prophesy. And again, when you think about this, Bishop Iona Locke, Google her. You'll get an example of a Nataf type prophet. Google, Google T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes has this particular prophetic anointing when he preaches. Okay? Um, listen to this. Um, okay, well, here's the scripture. Um, Luke chapter 3, verse... Three and four, he went into all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the, for, for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Who is this? This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a prophet. But well, what kind of prophet was he? He was a preaching prophet. Okay, listen to this. These are the ways the prophetic flow out of a person, not necessarily the type of prophet they are. People can flow in multi dimensions. So let's move on to how to recognize the prophetic call. There are two templates that I'm going to give you as an example, and I'm going to make it very simple. Number one, there's the Old Testament example, which is Jeremiah chapter one, verse one, verse four through five. You can read that. It's clear. The Old Testament example, God himself calls you, okay? Through a word, through a vision or a dream, God through the Holy Spirit makes it known to you as an individual somewhere throughout your life, growing up as a child and to um, a teenager or in your adult life, God, in a word, a dream, a vision, somehow, some way, he makes it known to you before any man or woman, hey, I called you to be a prophet and you know it. You may have not had the language. You may have not had the know-how. You may have not had the ex education or experience of the scriptures. You just knew in your spirit that you were a prophet or you were prophetic or you were gifted in some spiritual areas, okay? Um, I did not incorporate Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, which is a very familiar passage that we use sometimes when we're talking about how can you determine if one is a prophet. And the reason why I did not incorporate that scripture is because it does not apply to New Testament prophets because we are under a new model of the prophetic ministry. So here is the New Testament example on how to recognize if you are called to the prophetic. Um, two verses, 2 Peter and then 1 John Four, one through six. Read that. The New Testament sign is the fruit of your character and your doctrine and your teaching 
and the fact that your gift in office is recognized by other spiritual leaders. Did you hear that? In the New Testament, this is how you recognize if God is calling you to the prophetic ministry. One, by your character, and I'm getting this, and I'm, I'm not reading the scriptures, but these bullet points A and B is, is coming from these two scriptures, 2 Peter and 1 John, by your character, by your doctrine, and by it being acknowledged by other people. Number two, all New Testament prophets should have someone who is an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, an evangelist, and a teacher acknowledge their office. That is the setup for the New Testament model on how to determine if you are a prophet. It should be confirmed affirmed, or at least acknowledged by someone else in the ministry, friends and family. Okay. So how do we develop our prophetic language and expression? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 50, verse seven, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like stone determined to do his will. I want you to know something, friends and family, with every spiritual office that God gives us, there is a particular DNA or characteristic or personality that is contributed in that office. What do I mean? If you are a prophet, you have a prophetic personality. If you are a teacher, you have a teaching personality. If you are a pastor, you have a pastoral personality, which means you're very loving, kind, patient, and compassionate. If you are a prophet, you have a prophetic personality, and that prophetic personality helps to determine your language and how you express yourself. Verse, um, bullet point eight, A, um, it says flint, okay? It's a tough, dark rot is used figuratively in the Bible to express hardness as it is firm. Why? Because your prophetic personality makes you firm. It makes you stubborn. It makes you hard. Why? Because of the assignment and the audience and the people who you are called to serve. For each office, as I said, there's a prophetic personality built into that office and it is a mindset of determination and strong will. The prophet has a very hard mindset of stubbornness, determination, and you are strong-willed. Why? Because in order to be an oracle of God, in order to speak the word of God, there is something about your personality that must have the willingness to be strong and steadfast, even when people are resisting you. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 4 then he says son of man go to the people of Israel and give them this message I am not sending you to foreign foreign persons whose language you cannot understand no I'm sending you to people with strange and difficult speech if I did they would listen but the people of Israel won't listen to you any more than they would listen to me for the whole for a whole lot of them are hard hearted and stubborn. But look, I have made you obstinate and hard hearted as they are. I've made your forehead as hard as the hardest rock. So don't be afraid or fear their angry, angry looks, even if they are rebels. Listen, God fashions your character to deal with the particular audience God sends you. This is why you don't need to apologize for how God made you concerning what is of the spiritual character. I'm not talking about works of the flesh and you're being mean and ugly. That's works of the flesh. You need to purge that, get deliverance, grow up in the Holy Spirit. But there are certain parts of your character that God built in you because he knew your audience and he knew the people that you would have to minister to. So you should not compare yourself with others in their personality because of the kind of prophet that God has made you. Let's read this. Oftentimes God will send a prophet to a community that has rebelled against the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. So when the prophet comes, your words are sharp and direct. Why are we direct and sharp sometimes? Not all the time. Because by the time the office of the prophet has to come up or raise its voice, God has already had to speak to the pastor, he's already had to speak to the teacher, and he's already had to speak to the evangelist. It's just like in a school. You didn't listen to the teacher, you didn't listen to the, the assistant teacher, you didn't listen to the, the evangelist, so now you have to listen to the principal. It works the same way in the kingdom of God. Most times God will sing the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist because their personality is more soothing and nurturing and soft and compassionate 
it because it's the pastoral heart. The 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 the, the, the heart of the evangelist is a soul winning heart. So they're going to do everything to make sure that you get it because they want you to win. But when the prophet comes, it's time for correction and readjustment, exposure and realignment. So the words of the prophet and the apostle oftentimes, because they are governmental positions, they are governmental office. It carries a governmental word that deals with order and structure. And sometimes it is hard to hear. Friends and family, this concludes course three of prophetic ministry, and I hope you gain an idea concerning the different kind of prophets there are so that we can no longer compare ourselves to others and then how to recognize that you're called to the prophet using both Old and New Testament examples. And then lastly, how to develop your prophetic expression in language. This comes through the word of God. It comes to the word of God. Your prophetic language comes to the people group that you are ministering to. Paul said, I become all things to all men. God will fashion your language and your tone predicated upon the community. And if you are called to different people in different seasons, you'll find that he puts a different kind of tongue on you and in you predicated upon who you are assigned to in different seasons. Friends and family, again, this is Pastor of Overcoming Church. I'm glad that you're taking this course with me. Please be patient with me as we go ahead and upload the remainder of the courses. And again, it's not a requirement, but ask the Lord, how can I sow back into this ministry? Okay, God bless.